So in this video, we're going to talk about buffering against variability. Um, so variability is the villain, which we're going to learn about in this class. And one reason it's the villain is because for us in operations or in supply chains, if we have variability, we need buffers to make sure we meet uh, demand. And so we'll talk about what that means. Um, in terms of the agenda for today, this is one of many in our new module. Um, and so we're going to start kind of introducing ways to buffer against variability. This is from factory physics, um, as well as making a connection to capacity planning or um, aggregate planning, which will be the follow on video. So I'm going to start this topic with a motivating um, question. So um, if you were in charge of, let's say, a facility and you were proposed with one of two options, which option would you prefer? Do you prefer A or do you prefer B? And so if you can't, you know, just to give you a context is we're fulfilling exactly the same amount of demand in these two um, graphs. Um, so if I summed up over from January, February, all the way to June, we'd get the same amount of demand in these two options. The difference is um, not in average or total performance, but it's in what changes month to month. So A has a demand varying from month to month. B has a constant demand. So in other words, B has zero variability. A has variability in the demand. So hopefully, uh, if you had this uh, question presented to you, hopefully you would pick B. B is going to be a lot easier to manage. We're going to be a lot more efficient with our resources than if you had A. So if you ever come across the situation and someone presents these options to you, B is the, the correct answer in terms of an operational performance, resource utilization, using less buffers, et cetera, which we'll go through in this class. Unfortunately, usually you don't get to make this decision. Oftentimes the world is A. So um, you know, usually in reality, demand requirements vary month to month, or if you're working at a restaurant, you have different hour to hour, or if you're at Disney World, 15 minutes to 15 minutes, things aren't smooth, okay? So the more likely question you will get in your job is, this is the reality. We need to meet this demand forecast, which is not smooth. The question to you as an industrial and systems engineer is, okay, how do I deal with this? And here are some options. Um, so one option could be, all right, well, April has the highest demand. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, have a full-time workforce that meets the demand in April. And so what happens in January is I'm just going to have um, extra capacity, right? So I have workers that don't actually have anything uh, to do to produce for demand, but maybe we can use them for other things. Um, but I'm going to meet basically in higher so that I can meet April and have idle resources the other times. Another option could say, no, nah, I'm just going to use March. So I'm going to hire enough people to meet in March. Um, but then what happens for April is I'm going to say, OK, you guys have to work overtime. You need to work extra um, to make sure I meet the, the demand um, in April. So that's another option. Option C could be, OK, no, I'm just going to take the average and I'm going to basically use the average, and then um, I'm going to try to build up inventory. So in January, I'm less than the average, but I'm going to make enough so that I'm going to hold some stuff in, in inventory so that I have enough here um, and so forth. And then you may say, OK, that might I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to still only staff for the average. But what happens in April is, you know, lots of people want my stuff. I'm not going to be able to make the delivery till May or June. So I'm going to be late on my delivery. So which one do you, you know, prefer um, as a supply chain manager, as an operations manager, as an industrial engineer? These are types of uh, decisions that you will oftentimes have to make. Um, and the short answer is there's no right or wrong answer. There's no easy answer. They all have trade-offs. There's pros and cons. And the short answer is all of these are different ways of buffering against variability. Um, and we'll get into that um, to understand more what that means. I'll define some things. But the short answer is, you know, you have to pay for this variability. The fact that you have um, not a flat demand, you have to pay for it in some way, whether that's having extra idle resources, if you picked A, whether that's using overtime, which may not be ideal um, for B, 
um, whether it's uh, using inventory um, as a buffer or using time as a buffer, making people wait. These are all things um, companies usually use some sort of combination of um, and we'll learn about. But the key thing here is to go back to the previous slide. If you had the option to pick B, this decision would be easier. But because the world is variable, we have to make these trade-offs. So this lecture is one of many that I call variability is the villain. So variability causes operating problems and must be managed and also must be accounted for when we make decisions. And a key thing I would like you to get out of this lecture is that a system with less variability requires less capacity for the same service level. And we'll go through examples um, that hopefully build that intuition. Um, but before we do, it might be useful to define some terms. And so in terms of some definitions, what is capacity? Capacity is a term about what we can do. So it's the volume of products or service that can be produced by an enterprise using current resources. So you may say your capacity for the month is 1 million units. That's like what I could do. That doesn't mean I do that, but it's my capacity to do so. Maybe your restaurant can uh, serve 100 people per hour. That's like what I could do. That doesn't mean I always serve 100 people per hour. Right? So it's like our, uh, what we can, uh, what is our capacity to do? Production is what we actually did, right? So it's the volume of products or services that were produced by an enterprise. Just because we have the ability to make 500 widgets per hour, maybe we only produce 350. So there is a relationship between production and capacity per period. If I don't have the capacity to do it, I can't produce more than that. Right? So my production could be less than my capacity, but it can never be more than my capacity per period. And then inventory um, is what we have. So it's physical product that has not been allocated to demand yet. So one of the great things about supply chains is we can actually build inventory. So sometimes if you've talked um, lean manufacturing, sometimes inventory gets a bad rap, but inventory is actually a really powerful thing it allows us to make steady um, production cycles. And so inventory is not something that we can do in a service. We can't inventory a service, which we'll talk about in this lecture as well, but in manufacturing, we can inventory things. And that's actually a very powerful tool to have. Um, so to go back to you know, our two examples, um, what uh, to get some intuition about you know, capacity, and variability, right? So um, one kind of rule is that a system with less variability requires less capacity for the same service level. So again, as a reminder, capacity is what we can do, right? So if I wanna set my capacity over these uh, six months, if I have uh, in A, if I wanna say, I wanna meet 100% of my requirements each month, I could set the capacity at 4,000, okay? So at setting it at 4,000, I'm able to meet all of my demand over those months. Um, in part B though, to meet 100% of my requirements each month, I can set it at, let's say less than 3000 and I'm still able to meet my demand. So service level is this idea that, am I able to meet my commitments? So both of these have the same service level. They have 100% service level. However, I need more capacity in a system that has higher variability. I need less capacity in a system that has lower um, variability. And so this is one reason why variability is bad, is it causes us to basically have less efficient resources when you have variability. Okay, so that's one way to buffer against variability. You can think about using capacity, um, but you can use other things. You don't have to just use capacity. Um, but you have to buffer against variability using some type of buffer. So variability in a system will be buffered by some combination of either inventory, capacity, time, or money, or some combination of these things. And so what do I mean by these? One of the key things here is I'm using them as a buffer, which means there is extra uh, of them. So if I use inventory as a buffer, that means I build up extra inventory during lower demand periods to use later, okay? Capacity as a buffer means I have extra capacity. 
which means I um, am not using that capacity and therefore I have idle resources. If I use time as a buffer, I make my customers wait. That means either waiting in line or um, delaying delivery. So if you've ever waited in line before you could get served, they're using time as a buffer. You as the customer is waiting. Be, their capacity is at full. They're serving everybody. They're using uh, time as a buffer. And money is a little bit more subtle, but what we do here is we change how much we charge for something in order to influence the demand given we usually have a fixed capacity. This is something that we will see that is very common in, for example, airlines that have a very fixed capacity. They have so many seats on a plane. And so they change the price if it's ever cheaper or higher to influence demand to meet capacity. Um, so a couple of things here I wanna emphasize is the word buffer. Um, so just because uh, something has money in it doesn't mean you're using money as the buffer. Just because something has capacity doesn't mean I'm using capacity as a buffer. It's the extra stuff. And maybe an example will help um, explain what I mean by that. So what if you're a distribution center and you hired a full-time labor so that you could fulfill 200 orders per hour? So this is what you could do, right? So our capacity is 200 orders per hour. So then if I go and I go and observe what's happening and for a given hour, um, I only have a hundred orders. Okay? Um, so then what buffer are we using? We're using capacity as a buffer because we have extra capacity of idle capacity. I could have fulfilled way more orders, but I didn't have any demand. So that's using capacity as a buffer. But then maybe the next hour, I have way more than a hundred orders. So in this hour I'm observing, I have 200 orders that show up. So given I can only process two, uh, 220 orders, given I can only process 200, what happens to these last 20? They're late. I said I would get them to you tomorrow, you get them the day after. And so this is an example of using time as a buffer. And so there is usually um, some combination of these things. Oftentimes, on average, you know, you'll do uh, set some capacity level. Sometimes demand is higher than that. Sometimes it's lower than that. And so you're using a combination of capacity as a buffer. That happens when you have extra capacity. So you use capacity as a buffer if your capacity is greater than your demand. And then at other times, you're using time as a buffer. So if capacity is um, smaller than demand, you have more demand than you can fulfill then usually time is the one that you use. So I say, man, I couldn't get to you. I have to get to you tomorrow and it's late. So one of the key things here is in most systems, you try to set capacity that balances these two things. But if you observe it kind of operationally, sometimes there's idle capacity, that's capacity as a buffer. Sometimes there's using time, making your customers wait, that's time as a buffer. Um, and so, you know, your job as an industrial and management engineer, as a supply chain manager, is to understand, you know, how is the best way to buffer against variability. And so I want to just explain um, different systems, different business models, both in the furniture industry, using different ways to buffer against variability. So IKEA um, typically uses inventory of a buffer. So if you've ever been to an IKEA store and you go buy something, they have a ton of inventory in their stores. In fact, they have almost like a warehouse of inventory. What does that allow you to do is in their stores, they have inventory, but if you look um, away from the uh, retail store and look at the manufacturing, what they can do is they can make their production really flat, right? So their production could be really efficient because they put the buffer of inventory later. Um, and so that's an example of using inventory as a buffer. If you think about a make to order furniture store, they don't use inventory because they don't even start making your furniture until you order, right? And so if it's like a make to order, Inventory is not used, at least for final products, right? And so they have um, two kind of other options. Um, they may use capacity as a buffer. So if you go and call up and say, hey, I wanna redo my kitchen. Can you make me this custom cabinet? And if they can get to it right away, likely they 
that means they have idle capacity at certain times. And if so, if they're really flexible and really responsive, that probably means at other times they have idle um, capacity. If you call up someone and say, can you make me this? And they're like, yep, I can get to it in five months from now. What they're doing is they're using time as a buffer. They are you know, fully at capacity, but they're making you the customer wait. So this is, uh, all of these systems have capacity, the demand, or all of these systems have variability. The demand for furniture changes over time, uh, but they're using different buffers um, to buffer against that variability. So um, my kind of takeaway message here is that while we cannot change the fact that variability will exist in the world, especially for demand, demand is typically variable. Um, it will degrade performance. You know, all of these have trade-offs. Inventory costs us money, right? We have capital invested. Extra capacity costs us money. We have resources in terms of machines and people sitting idle. And time costs us money because usually your customers only have so much tolerance for time. You might even have to discount them, et cetera. So all of these um, degrade performance. They're all not great, um, but we will need to deal with them because the world is variable, but we do have a choice of which one do we want. And so what is the appropriate choice? Usually this is influenced by the system that we're operating in, by the cost, by the requirements, by the ethics of the systems we're um, operating. So my goal here is to go through a couple of examples to see which one of these um, buffers are most appropriate. So if you're a retail company and you sell ballpoint pens, what do you think is the most appropriate buffer? Do you think you should buffer with inventory, buffer with capacity, buffer with time, or buffer with money? The correct answer here is inventory. Usually ballpoint pens are extremely cheap, so they're not a really expensive thing if you have an in, uh, inventory. Also, um, usually at the retail store, you're not producing things. And so when you go there, typically go to buy a pen, there's usually inventory hanging out. Okay? So inventory is probably the most obvious example of uh, buffering um, if you're the retail company and you're selling you know, ballpoint pens. What if I now ask you what's the most appropriate buffer for an ambulance service? Should I buffer with inventory? Should I buffer with capacity? Should I buffer with time? Should I buffer with money? So let's just go through these one by one. So my first question is, can you buffer an ambulance service with inventory? What would that mean? That would mean, okay, tomorrow you need an ambulance, but I'm gonna service you today. Like that doesn't make sense, right? You cannot buffer uh, with inventory for a service. And the reason you can't use inventory to buffer against a service is services are unique in the sense that there is this simultaneous consumption, right? So demand occurs at the same time you meet that resource. And so you cannot inventory a service. Therefore, I can't inventory my ambulance services. So inventory is not even feasible. It's not appropriate. So then let's go to capacity. So what would be an example of buffering with capacity? If I go and look at my hospital and I go and I basically take a stopwatch and I just watch the ambulance, is the ambulance always being used? The short answer is no. Most of the time, the ambulance is likely sitting idle. It's parked until it gets a call. And that's because we want really high levels of service. We wanna make sure we can get to people quickly because it's life and death. So B is the correct answer. Um, ambulances services usually um, buffer against variability with capacity, which means the utilization of this resource is usually pretty low. And that's because we need to be responsive. And we need to be responsive because it's life or death if I'm not. Another option, which is a bad answer, would be time. I could say, nope, I wanna make sure my ambulances are moving all the time they're being used. But what happens then if I have more than your average demand for ambulances, you would need to wait to get an ambulance and likely that could cause um, fatalities. And so time is a, a feasible option in the sense that it could be a decision, but it's a very unethical one, right? And then money, okay, the idea here um, is if you 
want to change. So if, if you have really high demand for ambulances, let's say on Super Bowl Sunday, um, then I'm going to charge you more uh, for using that ambulance on a really high demanded night than a low demanded night. That doesn't happen. Again, there's some ethical reasons for that. Um, so money is not really an appropriate one. So the correct answer with ambulances is capacity. And so a key thing here is if I go and measure my utilization, my resource, it's probably pretty low. And that's still an OK uh, thing because we want to be really responsible. My next question is, what is an appropriate variability buffer for organ transplant? So if you or any of your loved ones um, needs an organ transplant, at least in the US, unfortunately, what has to happen is you have to get on a waiting list. And so unfortunately, we don't have extra capacity in this country. Um, and so instead, when you go and need an organ, you have to wait. And so how are they um, buffering against variability? They're using time. So anytime someone has to wait, um, time is being used. And then my final example are airline tickets. And so if you've ever flown on an airplane and asked someone sitting next to you, what did you pay for your ticket? And then compare it to what you paid for your ticket. Oftentimes there's changes in that. I paid more or less than the person sitting next to me. What is happening? Um, basically, airlines use money as a buffer. So what happens is if there's higher demand, they charge uh, the price they want to charge for. When there's lower demand, they drop the price to increase the demand. And so you can think about the buffer here is if, if demand was constant, I would never have to make a cheaper ticket. I would leave them all at the same price. But because there's variability in demand, I want to entice those people to fly when I have low demand and so I'm going to give you a cheaper ticket. Why do you do this in certain industries and not others? The key thing here is um, any industry that has a lot of really high fixed cost, um, this is when money could be appropriate. So when you think about an airplane, once it takes off, it doesn't cost that much more if there's 200 people or 199 people on that plane, right? Most of it's the fixed cost of taking off. And therefore, they're incentivized to fill the plane. That doesn't happen with every kind of um, experience. For example, when you go to a restaurant, you know, it does cost different amounts of money if you serve 199 versus 200 people because you have food and all of that stuff. And as a percent, there's more what's called variable cost than fixed cost. And so usually use money as a buffer when there's um, a large portion of your costs are associated with these fixed costs. Um, less portion of it is variable. So airlines would be an example of that. So the key thing here is that we will always have variability. Therefore, we will always need to buffer against variability. Um, so unfortunately, we can't get rid of variability. We can try to reduce it. And that is really key. If you've ever um, heard of Six Sigma, the whole idea of Six Sigma is reducing variability. And this is why. I can reduce variability, I can have less capacity, which is more efficient. I could have less inventory, again, more efficient, et cetera. So it's really powerful to try to reduce variability. That being said, you will always have some variability, therefore you'll always have to work with buffers. However, you can be smart about how you do that and you get to choose which kinds. So it's not true that you um, can't do anything about buffers. In fact, you can reduce how much buffers you have by being smart about them. For example, you could still have to buffer with capacity, but if I'm able to have a more flexible workforce, I don't have to have as much idle capacity. So if I can get people to do overtime in one month, I still probably need to buffer with capacity, but I don't have to have as much of it. Um, again, you get these same things with seasonal workforces or subcontracting. These are ways of making your capacity not flat and that, um, allows you to match your demand and your supply a little bit closer, which means you can have less buffers. Um, you can also think about using dual facilities. So pooling of your resources allows you to have less variability. We'll see that um, throughout this course. Um, and so designing any flexibility um, also allows you to be um, smarter with your buffers, which means you can have less of them, but you still need to have a buffer. In inventory, again, if we can pool um, components, that allows us to have lower variability. We'll explore this a lot um, later in the semester. Um, you can also think about building inventory of high demand or predictable demand products 
um, and then waiting, maybe make to order on less uh, demanded, lower demanded, or very volatile um, products. So there are things you can still do. It's not like, okay, variability exists, I can't do anything. Um, you can still do a lot, uh, but realize that there, um, you're always going to have some sort of buffer because the world is variable. <laughs>